Which was just about him, I think it was about him being pissy to losing the belt to Undertaker, yeah. but that's just it. Yeah, Hogan's backstage he, he just politics, wasn't a fan of the Taker at all. His bear hug dry hump move. Yeah. What was that? It was sort of uh, in the corner, sort of humping yeah. animal. Wrestling. Wrestling. Ooh, yeah! <laughs> Go on, you do me your own. Ooh, yeah! That was bad. Thanks, thanks. Hello and a very warm welcome back to the Gimme a Hole Yeah Wrestling Podcast. My name is Dom and this is... Ant. And we are dominant, obviously dominant, as in dominant people. Really in, trying to push that. As in those people that you find, you know, whipping people and, and doing crazy sexy things. We're those people. We may or may not be those people. But woo, this is a good episode because woo. it's the debut. Woo! The debut of a wrestler. Which wrestler? Are you, why are you chopping me? I'm chopping you. Woo! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm gonna moonsault your ass in a second. You can't yeah. moonsault. You can, you know, you know, what are you gonna do? His gonna daughter moonsault. can moonsault. His daughter can moonsault. His daughter can moonsault. Yes. Uh, so we're looking today at Survivor Series Whoa. from 1991 in the Joe Lewis Arena, Detroit, Michigan. Some new debuts in this pay per view. <laughs> you remind me a little bit of Ric Flair. Uh, yeah. No, more like uh, Charles Mini Flair. Uh, yeah, Charles Robinson. Charles Robinson, yeah, the referee. Little, little, little Mini Flair. Little, little Mage. Mage. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before. I've interviewed Ric Flair. He's a very nice man. Is he? Yes. Good. Quite, he's got a bit of an ego on him, as yeah. you would imagine. Pro- but very, I can but, imagine. But, but very nice. Are you you know? When you talk about him, are you going to give us some insights from that interview? When you, uh, when you get when you get to know him, when you get into the conversation a little more. At first, you start off, and he's a bit. Well, when like, you say get into the conversation, from what I remember you telling me is he didn't understand a word you yeah, were saying to him. Yeah, he couldn't understand me for a while because of my your Yorkshire funny accent. whole accent. Yeah, because of my Yorkshire, he's like, he was like, I'm like, hi, Rick, and he's like, this is Rick Flair, and I'm like, he didn't say woo. At all, <laughs> well, really no, he wouldn't. Me. No, but he was like, and he kept, he kept thinking I was asking him if he was Rick Flair, and I was like, hi, Rick. It's Dom. And it <laughs> hey, was, Rick. And it was taking him ages to figure out that I wasn't asking if it was Ric Flair. I was just saying, hi, Rick. Are you okay? <laughs> hi, Rick. How's it going? But once we got into it, it was good. Sounds good, man. You can find that on soundsfearmag.com. There you go. Google Check it, it out, man. Yeah. Check it out. You'll have to post this. Uh, post a link to it on our Facebook as well. I will. Well. I will post good for people to, to read. Um, so there's a, a massive wrestler that's included, obviously, Ric Flair, uh, who had a huge influence on wrestling, not just in the WWF, Ooh. but all over, especially in the territories mm-hmm. uh, we also get to see an Undertaker versus Hulk Hogan title match in this pay-per-view for the very first time as well as a load of backstage politics that happens after the match but we'll go into that uh, when we get to it um, also the main event is the Legion of Doom and Big Boss Man trying to overcome IRS and the natural disasters sounds good on paper it does this whole this pay-per-view, pay-per-view sounds, sounds good on paper, on, um, on paper. Yeah. it might actually be the most I'm not sure it's the most boring one we've watched, but it's not... It's, it's not, disappointing, isn't it? It's not it? the best, Disappointing, it? but best. we'll oh. get into all of that and more. If you're enjoying the content, please give us a like and comment down below. If you've got any questions or disagree with us at any point, mm. write it down and uh, subscribe for more videos just like this one. Don't forget you can buy cups like the ones we're drinking our tea from and T-shirts like the one we are wearing on our bodies, on our beautiful, sexy bodies. Um... God, I've, I've, maybe I'm getting, maybe maybe I am feeling a bit Ric Flair. You are getting the am, soul I'm of Ric Flair feeling, in you. I'm, I'm feeling Ric Flair today. I'm, oh, like, yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm feeling super cocky and confident. Woo. So yeah, just uh, buy some shirts. Otherwise, <laughs> I'll chop you and I'll um, put you in the finger four leg lock. The finger four leg lock. That would be your finisher. The, the, the finger fin- four. You'd like uh, like a like, like a, a th- little, oh. like a thumb war. Ah. Like a thumb war. Yeah. Can I have a thumb war? Can I have a thumb One, two, three, four. I declare a thumb war. Woo! All One, right. two, three, four, I win a thumb war. I win a dirtiest thumb war. Player in, dirtiest player in the game. He raked Woo! my eyes. He raked my eyes. Uh, so commentating today, we have Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon, who were both off the game tonight. A bit I all over know, the place man. I, liked, I liked Heenan. Heenan was, he, Heenan was my favourite he's ever been tonight. No, no, he was way better the last one with Roddy, I thought. Um, mm. But uh, no, just uh, there was a few points. I don't think they built up the matches very well at certain points. And there was a really frustrating thing about this pay-per-view and that's next Tuesday at Texas oh yeah yeah all 
all the way through, like heavily promoting WWE the next WWE really just wanted to see you next Tuesday, and it was like... They just wanted it was, more money, just buy the next was, pay-per-view. You know, uh, it was like, we, and I had major issues with that. Yeah, just constantly constantly repping uh, for, for next Tuesday, um, where you will see, and you would have seen, because it's now ingrained in our memory, Jake the Snake Roberts square up against Macho Man Randy Savage. Yes, the problem with it, well, we'll get into it. So the show starts off with a, the, the segment from Superstars, where Jake the Snake Roberts is attacking Macho Man Randy Savage. Macho Man Randy Savage is back in the ring due to Warrior being fired from the mm-hmm. WWF. We see the whole thing with the snake biting him, and uh, it's King a great Cobra. segment, man. A great a king, segment. A king fucking cobra. A king cobra. Bites. With, with, with backstage, with Macho Man's permission, Macho Man gave his permission to, to have a real King Cobra bite him on the arm, and you could see the blood squirting out of his arm, and it's really horrible. Squirting, that's how, dramatic. How far would you go for your job? Like, I hope you pay attention to these podcasts, because I really want to know what you guys do and how far you've gone for your job, because that... Because I'm shit scared of snakes, man. Would you let a snake bite you for this podcast? Uh, if, I, if I, no, well, yeah, well, actually, no, I do love it quite a lot. So Good. it depends what, yeah, if, if it was for entertainment value, Good. actually, yeah. I was uh, going to say. Uh, next week on the show, we're going to have a snake biting Dom. I thought you were asking me if, if for a WWE contract, and then I was like, yes. No, no, I yes, wasn't. Yes, 100%. No. 100%. <laughs> I would do, I would No, do, just yeah. for the, our podcast. But for the, so, no, I would. You're not getting a WWE I, contract. After, uh, after, I'm more likely to get one than you. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, now that James Ellsworth has gone, yeah, actually. Yeah, There's a yeah. part of you in the company, yeah, I suppose. Know. It's all right. It's, um. it's uh, you know, it's also Giant Gonzalez. You know, you could you could replace Giant Gonzalez. It's, I it's, could. It's a slow Get me moving, a bodysuit. Yeah, a slow lumbering <laughs> moving hairy one that doesn't really do much. Uh, Miss Elizabeth just comes out distressed. It, he did get tombstoned. Miss Elizabeth comes out distressed. Um, after this macho kite fight in the ring due to the venom coursing around his veins. He's I like stumbling around. He's acting. Vince here. McMahon didn't, didn't do a bad job no, on commentary, no. actually. Uh, no. Selling the whole, this whole thing. Yeah. Better I mean, than than Vince McMahon normally does on commentary at that point. Obviously, it was kayfabe that the snake still had poison, so obviously yeah. it didn't, but they, on 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 on, uh, on screen, they said it did. Interestingly enough, uh, Jake Jake couldn't get the snake off him for a while. You no. know when he's shaking the snake? He's, he's trying, trying to get, to get, him get off. it off, yeah. But obviously, like, it looks like he's trying to make it by harder, but he's trying to get it off, and he yeah. manages to do that. But there's no poison coursing through his veins, despite Macho Man Randy Savage's excellent acting ability, where he's yeah. stumbling around and trying to hit... Jake Elizabeth comes out and looks fantastic she really sells it as well sells the panic of it all we've yeah. got kids in the audience Ooh, crying uh, at this point it's a, it's a great little segment it's a classic classic sort of video yeah. from, from old WWF um, apparently rumour is the snake died a week later yeah let me find that because you keep saying that rumor, to me rumour yeah. Um, 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 yeah probably because of all the Drugs in Macho Man. Fights Randy Savage. <laughs> Did he have, was he doing loads of drugs? No, I don't think he was doing many drugs. Yeah. Um, no, he was too professional, wasn't he? He was, he was a very good worker in the ring. Uh, so Jack Tunney will not allow Macho Man to fight at Survivor Series due to the incident. He was supposed to take part in the main event with Jake the Snake. And instead, they're having a match at Tuesday in Texas pay-per-view, um, which Jack Tunney has made it illegal to have reptiles at ring, even though Jake is the real snake. Yeah, it was... Um, yeah, he's also reinstated Macho Man as a, as a full-time wrestler as well due to the incident. Fair enough. It, again, this is them sort of taking off what was a potential good feud for one of the big four and putting it on a... a smaller pay-per-view later on in the week and and again them trying to sell that instead of putting all the talent out there that they've got and just having them go in the ring there was having them um having them advertised for this tuesday in texas which was constantly drilled into us throughout the night so the first match contains the mounty rick flair i can't find specific reference to the snake dying but there's lots of people saying that yeah a few weeks after mm. it did die yeah um and also that jake the snake apparently um lived in the uk for a period of time and while he was over here got done for animal cruelty for letting his python die oh really i mm. didn't know that yeah you can you can imagine him being quite forgetful um, oh, I don't know. Back in the, he, I think he looked after the snake, like putting it in bathtubs and hotels and stuff like that to keep mm. it cool. Damien loved a shower, as we all know. Yes, indeed. Uh, so the first match is the Mountie, Rick Flair, Ted DiBiase, the Warlord, with Harvey Whippleman, Jimmy Hart, Mr. Perfect, and Sensational Sherry. They were versing Bret Hart, the Bulldog, the British Bulldog, Roddy Piper, and Virgil. Mm-hmm. Rick Flair. 
As you know, we like to go through the wrestlers that are joining the WWF in the first pay-per-view and go over a little bit of the history of them. So give us a little bit of history on Ric Flair, dude. Yeah, man. Uh, obviously, there's a lot going. You know, there's a lot going with Ric Flair. So I'll try and give you a, a small uh, insight. Uh, just a couple of facts. He's recognised um, by a lot of major wrestling publications as a 16-time World Heavyweight Champion. Obviously, champion in the NWA, six-time WCW World Champion, two-time WWF Champion. Although his actual number of World Championship reigns varies depending on source, but he considers he considers himself a 21 time world champion he is the first, he is statistically the first considered the first WCW world champion um, and the first WCW international world champion which is interesting so many titles yeah. uh, he, became, he became the first person to complete the WCW tri- triple crown which he also went on to complete later on in his career um, as, his, as, he, as he ended his career with the WWE he became a triple crown champion because he won the tag team championships and the intercontinental championship as well yeah. so he became an, an that was champion. with the evolution was it? Evolution, yeah, Batista, yeah. and then he also did it. You know, I think he won it during that kind of. You know, every match was a way to get him to retire. Kind of, yeah. you know what I mean? That Ending kind of in thing. the Shawn Michaels yeah. match at WrestleMania, yeah. which is excellent. Yes, it, well, it's one of the best matches in in wrestling history, as far as I'm concerned. Best matches. One of the best matches. Wow. In uh, wrestled in the uh, American uh, Wrestling Association uh, first through the 70s, uh, early 70s that is, and he went to Japan quite a lot as well. And oddly, I found out that he returned. Uh, he returned to Japan in 2013 um, and wrestled his, na- his last official match uh, over there. He's been. He's had a good relationship with Japan throughout his career, and he keeps popping back and doing tours and stuff. He's, he's probably one of the hardest working people I've ever I've ever encountered. He, did, like, he, he, was, just he was does, wrestling all. Over. Just so many different things. So, so he was um, when he when he became the NWA champion the first time. He was defending that in Japan. He was defending it all over the place. Obviously, we we know, we know that he is recognised in some form as the NWA champion as he enters the WWE as well. Uh, so he went to Jim Cro- Crockett Promotions, uh, which we've obviously covered quite a lot, and officially get the te- got the title of the Nature Boy. Um, and he actually had a f- feud with the original na- Nature Boy as well um, to kind of go through to kind of get that title which is which is really nice um he managed to win the nwa us title at this time um and also interestingly enough an interesting fact again during this period of his life was that he broke his back in five places due to a plane crash which happened in uh, uh, north carolina um the physios and the and the doctor said he would never wrestle again but he went through eight months of of rigorous physio and managed to return to the ring so incredible yeah incredible human (coughs) being um wrestled for the nwa um as well through the early 80s uh, beating dusty Rhodes to win uh, his first official title there um, he formed the Four Horsemen with obviously Flair Arn Anderson Ole Anderson and Tully Blanchard he would then go on to have legendary feuds uh, for the NWA title with Sting uh, and join WCW also fighting for the WCW championship at the same time um, this was all prior to, w- to Flair going to WWE um, he was fired um by the only reason that he lost his first, um, uh, the only reason he lost uh, the WCW title uh, was because he had disagreements. Uh, this was leading up to the 1991 debut on WWE or WWF television. Um, he had disagreements with um, the then WCW president uh, Jim Hurd about the direction of his character. Um, he wanted to um, Jim Hurd wanted to change Ric Flair from the Nature Boy to Spartacus. Jim have Hurd, him, man, he, I didn't he, know what he was doing. Have really. him wear a gold uh, like a diamond earring. Wow. And, and, and shave his head, and Ric Flair shave Ric Flair's yeah. head. Right. Nature that Boy. iconic bomb. Yeah. The Nature Boy. You want to. <laughs> you want to. You want to. You want to shave Ric Flair's head. Um, <laughs> naturally, he was like, no, and uh, no. and uh, no, and then um, nat- and strutted his way to the uh, to the WWF, uh, but got fired um, because he disagreed with Jim's um, Jim's suggestions, and thus had to vacate the WCW title. However, for one month, as the month this month this time when he entered the WWE, he was recognised as the P- as the as the other world champion for the other promotion, which was in fact the NWA. Yeah, which become a major storyline yeah. into in WWF. Yeah, so when yeah. The feud with Hogan. So this leads up to this time, of course. You know, we could we could look at Shawn Michaels' feud that ended his career. We could look at the Evolution. You know, with Triple H and Batista. You know, say what you want about him, but he was certainly you know, you know. I mean, obviously. 
you know, you can you can talk about his legacy. You can talk about how many women he slept with. You could talk about his his his, his tragic family situation, where you know he had a, he's lost he lost a son um, to to to, to dr- a drug overdose. Um, you've you've there's a lot that Ric Flair has been through in his in his life. And, you know, call it what you want. Obviously, ego is there and he's got a lot of it and whatever, but he is probably the greatest, you know. Um, I, I, I never really got excited, that, that excited watching him in the ring, but I certainly pulled for him towards the end of his career because he was just a hero, do you know what I mean? He became like the old guard and the hero and, and he's certainly a very, to talk to, a very interesting man and, and very humble Maybe more so in his later life. I think he was massive um, in terms of wrestling. He was a massive part of WCW becoming relevant um, and competition for WWF. At, even at this point with Starcade and his feuds against Sting, which were incredible. Yeah. He also, not I don't know if people know this, he, he wrestled a lot after his retirement mm. match at WWF. So yeah. the Shawn Michaels he to, thing, he went, to he went to TNA for a while for and, a brief time. And had some terrible, Sting. terrible... Matches with uh, with uh, Rick Foley, who was also Foley, yeah. who also wrestled after his retirement. Yeah, um, um, which begs a question of of when should a wrestler, uh, when is a wrestler's retirement? Think, when is a? I think Michaels is doing it right. I think it's down to choice. It's purely yeah. down to choice. It's down to it's down to saying no to stuff. And but how do you say no to Shawn Michaels versus AJ? Well, Styles? he already did it. I know, I know, I know. And there's a great uh, table for three on the network actually, where Shawn Michaels is sort of it's it's sat across the table next to uh, AJ Styles. Who else is in that? Michaels, God, AJ Styles. You know, it was someone. It was someone like Kevin Nash or someone like that. It was really? yeah, someone, and they they were like overseeing. It. I can't remember exactly who it was, <laughs> and um, yeah, he's sat across from these two that that would put on an amazing match, and yeah. I think that's the frustrating thing for Michaels fans because we saw him go out on such an incredible oh, yeah, high. Yeah. Like we all want him to be able to put on that, and whether he could or not, who knows? But um, I quite like his, I quite like his choice of of sticking it there, you know. Yeah. So no, that was awesome, man. Thanks very Good. much. Um, so back to the match. Sherry, sensational Sherry, looked like an Art Nouveau, Nouveau painting in this match. She, she was wearing she like is, gold outfit, very thirties. She is art. Man. 30s. She is art. Piece I, of art, man. I have yeah. so much time for sensational Sherry. Uh, Flair enters the ring. Uh, the when he comes down, ooh. Ooh, the music didn't have as much punch as it did later no, on in yeah, careers. Yeah. Um, and I really like Charlotte's remix of. Of yeah. the Ric Flair thing I think it's got a nice modern take I like Natalia's remix of the Bret Hart yeah, yeah. the, the Hart Foundation theme song he brings in his champions, championship belt and is described as the world real champion by Bobby Heenan uh, that plays into storyline with him and Hogan and, and a few other storylines later on uh, Heenan, Heenan comments on Bulldog's hairdo being like Whoopi Goldberg, yeah, Whoopi hair, Goldberg which I yeah. thought was a really nice little reference yeah, he's got his uh, hair in braids, braids yeah, at this braids, point yeah. Uh, a lot of feuds in the match, a lot of really interesting feuds. I went into the match quite looking forward to it. I'd seen the card and I was like, well, out of everything, I know the, about the Hogan Undertaker match, um, but this one looks like a really good lineup. Yeah. Uh, you've got David Boy and Warlord who were having a feud at the time, Virgil, DiBiase, and Piper who were all sort of instilled in the feud. Piper and Flair had been at it, Hitman and Mountie had been at it. You know, yeah, this was, was a sort of and, good and, lineup. And let's, let's, just, let's just do a shout out for Virgil, man. Virgil, Virgil put on the. Sh- uh, he was all right. I really liked yeah. Virgil. Too. I thought his show was. Great. I thought he was better at SummerSlam. Um, when he when he was uh, when he had more practice time, I guess, with DBSC. Mm. But he was all right, and the crowd loved him. Yeah. I think that was the thing. The story was great. Yeah. So that's why he was so over. It starts off with DBS and Piper, and the two do a great job of building up the crowd. A little bit of back and forth. Uh, the faces keep DBS in the corner and keep tagging to attack to DBS. Seeing some nice tactics mm-hmm. in a Survivor Series. We don't often see that, but it no. was nice. Uh, the crowd pop when Virgil gets in as soon as he steps in. As I said, they were all behind Virgil at this point. Ric Flair gets in and we hear boos from the crowd and we also hear a couple of woos from the audience that know his work. Woos and woos from Ric Flair. Uh, Because he was already a massive established star as soon as he came in. Uh, Similar to how Legion of Doom were when they first came in. It felt like everyone knew who they were straight away. Flair does his awesome falling down gimmick where he sort of gets hits and a couple of steps later falls down. Similar to Greg Valentine's sort of... He does it a lot, doesn't he? But not with as much style as Flair. Not with as much Flair. Not with as much Flair, baby. Uh, 
Uh, Warlord comes in and Bulldog enters to face him. The two did some nice work together again. These two have been working together a lot. A decent amount of time with all four in. Um, with no one being eliminated. It was it was yeah, good work. I was impressed with that. You know, a lot of Survivor Series, you see someone go out early. Yeah, this match was my... Was my, my Probably my favourite one of the night. I yeah, I thought it was. What okay. a shame it ended how it did. Yes, yes. Um, Bulldog goes for the pin on Mountie, but it's Flair who is the legal man. He jumps off the top rope to get the pin on Bulldog. Bulldog is eliminated, gutted um, by Flair, but a good selling for Flair yeah. there. You know, yeah. make him look dominant if he can beat the big guy in the company, Bulldog. Uh, Piper comes in and ends up in the heels corner, attacking everyone. A nice little spot, so Piper's got the advantage over all the heels, and he's just going back and forth. He. he, he, he Piper was good as a brawler. Yeah. He wasn't a great wrestler. He was great as a brawler. Yeah. You know? Um, which is a shock, really, because of his size. Like, you'd mm. expect him to be more wrestling than yeah. than sort of brawling. But he, he he did great. Piper gets Ric Flair into the figure of four leg, leg lock. Um, people, the, the commentary team state how that's Flair's move that he's made famous. Uh, the crowd are all cheering. DiBiase ends up breaking that. Virgil gets in with a Mountie, and Mountie goes for a tag, but no one else tags him. What happened there? Yeah, he sort of went around and just yeah. like, and and no one actually yeah. like put that. People were, it was to build Virgil as this beast. Well, yeah, you know, but why are you selling friends. Virgil as a beast, man? Ah, yeah, well, I, I dig it. I dig it. You dig it. You I dig, dig it. it. I dig All anything right. with Virgil getting a push. That was cool with me. Cool. Uh, Virgil's put into the full Nelson from Warlord, as we know, full Nelson's always uh, sold heavily from Warlord. Yes, very nice. Bret Hart breaks it up with an axe handle off the top rope, and Rock Pipe, Roddy Piper suddenly gets a pin on Warlord. I don't know why. Okay. Um, then the action really started to slow down at this part of the match. I thought the start of the match was quite good, and then everything went downhill went down from down here him. for the entire pay per view. Um, <laughs> Flair and Roddy get into the ring, and Piper doesn't sell Roddy's body shot. Uh, doesn't sell Roddy's shots. Uh, I thought, sorry, uh, Roddy Flair's, doesn't sell Flair's, Flair's shots. shots. I thought uh, it was. I like that. It was too much. I don't think it was... I loved it. I, lo- I, loved I think because it was in the corner of the ring, it yeah. wasn't done as well as if it had been in the centre of the ring. Yeah. I think it was just a bit sort of lost. I think it gets built... I think it, get, it built up a nice... That You know, there was a definite kind of fear, or at least a, a playful fear from Flair. Yeah. Versus, you know, versus um, Piper. Piper, yeah. Um... Roddy did a nice slam off the top rope on Flair. That was one of the bigger moves that we saw in the match. And when he's Irished, in, whipped into the corner, he flies over the top rope. Everyone at this point gets into the ring and they all start brawling and the referee calls for the bell. Hmm. Who's disqualified, Dom? Uh, everybody. Everybody except, for, except the for the person man. that's gone over the top rope and is out of the ring, which is Ric Flair. I really despise this ending, what, 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 especially for yeah. the what talent that we that? had in. Like you, you, you can put these guys over, you can make them look like beasts. Yeah, Ric Flair stands tall, but he didn't even really stand tall. He fell out of the ring, and yeah. it was a really. Po- I think that's the weakest ending to a Survivor Series match we've yeah, seen so seen far. For a long time, yeah. And it was an okay match at the start, and potentially my match of the night because it yes. you know, yeah, there I, I, I would have said it was mine too. Yeah. Um, Bobby Heenan was wooing over uh, commentary, which was great. Then we have an interview with Randy Savage. Uh, Gorilla Monsoon tells him, not Gorilla Monsoon, Gene Oakland tells him that 97% of people have been calling in and uh, getting Jack Tunney to reinstate Savage. Savage says he was delirious and hallucinating when the snake bit him, and the only thing he was, could hear in his in his was, was haze Elizabeth was Elizabeth Prime, Prime yeah. which was I nice. Quite, promo, I quite like the promo. The promos, yeah. promos were good today. Promos were the best thing about the Undertaker's promo at the end, Jake the Snake's promo, and Macho's promo. You liked promo. Jake's promo. I didn't like I Jake's did. promo. I it was right. pure evil. Came across like pure I evil. I get it. Come, oh yeah, we'll go into it in a second. Um, so uh, here we go again. At Tuesday in Texas, it'll be Macho versus Jake. Uh, the Macho is going to be all over you like melting butter. Okay. I liked it. You um, like, you uh, like uh, melting butter? I like uh, this one by Macho. Oh no, Elizabeth went and jo- goes and joins them. She wants to thank everyone. And does she predict a victory for Macho in Texas, Dom? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't get it I don't get why they're using one of the big four pay-per-views to sell a pay-per-view yeah, that's coming yeah. up I know why it's all about money but no it's annoying isn't it no it's annoying very annoying 
Um, so next match we have Jim Duggan, Sergeant Slaughter, the Texas Tornado, and Tito Santana versus the Berserker, Colonel Mustafa, Hercules, and Skinner with Adnan and Fuji. Yeah, first time we've seen a couple of these guys. It was very, very guys, much yeah. the, the bearded, the bearded team. They were all bearded team. Yeah, they're all bearded and they're all dirty. Uh, apart from Sheik, why not mustache? Sheet, weird, yeah. weird mustache. Um, so a little bit about the Berserker. In 1984, he started wrestling as the Barbarian in yeah, Mid South yeah. Wrestling, a name that we'd see used later on by uh, another person in WWF. So he wasn't going to come into the WWF with that. Um, he came into the WWF as the Viking, and he was name was soon changed to the Berserker. Berserker. Mm. He had a weird gimmick, didn't he? He, he had a weird. Like, it was, it was Viking, very, wasn't it? Very it was, dirty, and he was like. It was the sheep know, lick, shoes that I didn't licking like. Licking himself yeah, and all this yeah. kind of crazy stuff. He was just meant to be mental, I think. In Pacific Northwest Wrestling, he formed a tag team called the Breakfast Club, where after the match, the gimmick was that they'd pour Cheerios and milk on their opponents. That was his gimmick. Uh, later on, after the Survivor wow. Series feud, I know, man, it's great, isn't it? Wrestling. Uh, <laughs> wrestling. After his feud uh, at the Survivor Series, he'd gone to some matches with The Undertaker in an angle that saw him trying to stab The Undertaker with his sword. Okay, wrestling. Uh, his biggest notable win in WWF was in 1992 when he won a 40 man battle royale. Um, which saw him heading into a feud with Bret Hart for the World Championship. The Really? Yeah, the WWF title. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously, he didn't win that. No. The 40 man battle royale. What a mess that will have uh, been. Yeah, yeah. You know? Chaos. Well, that's maybe why he won it. The maybe Berserker. so. And then next up, the next new wrestler is Skinner. So Skinner was with Championship Wrestling between 1972 and 1982. So for a very long time, and a, a big, big part of that was in tag teams with the likes of Bob Batland and uh, Jimmy Garvin, as we as we know. Yes. Uh, he moved on to CWA, where he would form one half of the tag team, the Fabulous Ones, with Stan Lane, who held the belt 14 times. So a very recognised tag team wrestler mm. before coming into WWF. After joining WWF, he remained undefeated at this Survivor Series and would go on to. Face Bret Hart at Tuesday in Texas for the Intercontinental Championship, the one that we keep hearing about, where he'd lose the that, streak. That Tuesday, yeah, pretty sure Texas. He also played Doink the Clown on occasion, um, appearing in WrestleMania 9 as the other donk that helps Doink beat Crush during that. The other donk. The other doink, yeah. Uh, left WWF in 1994 and went to WCW in a tag team with Bobby Eaton, in, um, known as Bad Attitude. Although they never had much impact, and since the 80s he's had a wrestling school, and he's trained the likes of Diamond Dallas Page, Mike Awesome, and Dustin Rhodes. So there you go. There you go. Enjoy that. Mm, thank you. He was a, Skinner was a lot better and more exciting outside of the. He did a lot more for wrestling outside of the ring, I think, than uh, inside it. Yes, he was an early version of Luke Harper. What does Luke Harper do outside? The, oh, you, oh, you no, mean, he looks like. Oh, Luke he looks Harper. like Luke Harper, yeah. but except Luke Harper's ten times more talented. Wow. In, in my opinion, Luke Harper's one of the most talented and underrated people on the roster today. That's, Agreed. That's just my opinion. <laughs> so on to the match. We have the Berserker come down in his sheep wool boots. I hated them boots, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looks weak. A bit, it, a bit weird. Cartoony. Yeah, he looked like a cartoon, didn't he? Yeah, we, but we are entering that cartoon era, so that's what we can expect from now on, really. Indeed. Hacksaw enters with Slaughter, carrying the flag for him this time. Mm. Slaughter's turned face yeah, yeah, after the SummerSlam. Yeah. We talked a little bit about it in the last episode. Yeah, weird. Weird 360. By yeah, there are lots of those, though. Lots of those just random almost unexplained face turns yeah well up. the WWF had a lot of heat from the slot yeah, section yeah so they wanted to change it up to, I think yeah. yeah Skinner starts off against Tito Tito's now in bright green with the pink boots and the gold trim down the side of mm -hmm. it going more into the matador type gimmick isn't he at this yeah. point and, uh, yeah and he didn't, yeah he didn't, I didn't really like his his, uh, his his dealings with Tito on commentary he used to like uh, used to call him quite derogatory terms I used to think um, there's, there's some there's some particular 
particular ones that I'm trying to reference now, but um, if you go back and watch the paper, you'll see what I mean. And okay. they're just uh, Spanish I didn't know that. references to you know Spanish stuff and whatever. Yeah, but, like, yeah. He's quite uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, he's probably trying to do what um, Jesse Ventura did, but Jesse Ventura came off as really funny with it, with like the because he always called him Chico instead yeah. of Tito. Yeah. Which which come across as funny as opposed to something yeah racist it was, it was and you it's about, a fine line, isn't it? Yeah, it was something about like sauce, you know, and so you know calling him some kind of spicy you know uh, okay. spicy Spanish sauce or something. You know, okay. like, it wasn't that. It wasn't that, but it was something along those lines and it's a bit like yeah yeah too, a little too much because if you're not going to you know obviously if it's funny then you're going to do that across the board and you're going to have banter yeah banter-esque commentary but that wasn't banter-esque commentary that was just saying something for the sake of saying it's trying but then maybe that's Gorilla's fault for not uh, responding to it enough as well you know if yeah. it, maybe Keenan was setting it up for Gorilla and it, and it didn't get taken mm-hmm. as, as sometimes happens even on this podcast it's true sometimes I set things up for you and you don't take him what like what I don't know um, stuff stuff and things um, <laughs> Hacksaw and Hercules have a really boring exchange of punches at this point yeah. Hacksaw man he was a good character in the ring it was very much punches clotheslines yeah. nothing spectacular was it oh I mean great to get the crowd pumped up and I don't mind characters like that but it, it gets a bit same bit, same, bit same well. yeah. there's a lot of those kind of characters in there at this yeah. time yeah um, yeah to be honest, there's a the next the next part of the match has Hacksaw in again with Colonel Mustafa and again it's just boring. Not great. Slaughter gets in to spice things up and He's really, really slow. <laughs> it's really, really slow and it's boring. It's just what he does. Um, Be slow. He does an atomic drop and a slow motion clothesline to Colonel Mustafa. Obviously these two were in part of a tag team at SummerSlam, so that's where the feuds come in and he's he's face now. Uh, and Mustafa gets pinned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Slow motion. It's very much Slaughter's way of doing things. Man, isn't it? Yep. sloppy. I didn't realise how sloppy Slaughter was yeah, until we started rewatching Slaughter, this. Slaughter's sloppiness is only rivaled for me by uh, the natural disasters. Mm. I find them very sloppy in the ring. I don't. Uh, Particularly this paper. Not as bad as Slaughter. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying, especially later on. Okay, mm. cool. Anyway, um, Kerry Von Eric gets in, but again. Kerry Von Erich, who was a real talent in the ring. We've seen some great matches with him and Perfect in mm-hmm. the past. Uh, really sloppy moves against Hercules. Yeah, uh, not great at all. Tito comes in and picks up the speed genuinely at this point. Tito mm-hmm. is like the fastest thing in this match and, and makes it a little bit exciting yeah. until he gets pinned almost automatically by Hercules. It's like, oh man. Very what? odd. Here we go. So we've got um, Skinner. Um, with his super black mouth, he gets in the ring against Sergeant Slaughter and gets pinned by Slaughter. So it's four versus the Berserker. You're not really selling like a face team that overcomes the odds by having four against. Yeah, there was a couple. Of, there was a couple of this th- 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 these tonight, wasn't there? Where the faces were just like it was like two against one heel, and you're like, yeah, it's always better to have. There was one with Genetti. The Genetti match. But yeah, was again, just yeah, weird, not, not great anyway. at all. Yeah. Um, so, so Slaughter Irish whips the Berserker into Hacksaw and he gets his patented clothesline, mm-hmm. according to Gorilla. And the first team get the win in an absolute, what I felt was a nothing match mm-hmm. and potentially one of the worst matches we've seen at yep. Survivor Series um, in these pay-per-views, yep. in my opinion. Please let us know if you disagree. I'd be agreed. interested to know. Yeah, um, uh, agree, agreed. I agreed that I disagree with you, yes. Good. You, you disagree? I know. I mean, wait, you're, you're wait, in agreement. Well, I'm in agreement. Yeah. You're in agreement. Yeah, God. Good. God. It's, yeah. It's... So then we have an interview with Jerk the Snake. You say you like this. It was in an awful yeah. 80s sweater. Um, it was oh, yeah. that type of wool that yeah, was, was like grey wool. And you saw these all the time in the 80s, didn't you? Uh, it was grey wool with like speckles of colour in it. He actually just looked like um, grey static, <laughs> you know, yeah. like on a TV. It was weird, man. Yeah. Um, Jake says he's being painted as the original sinner. There will be no reptiles allowed at ringside, we're informed. And Jake says that the snake was always a toy and he is a snake that should be worried yeah, about. Was I enjoyed that, was, that bit. It was always a tool for him to just amuse himself, which yeah. I thought was quite funny. But then, well, not uh, funny, but, but quite, quite dark. It is, I I'm, agree, I'm, it was I'm quite dark. All, I'm all over the place today, but yeah, I'm, what I mean is that it was really, really dark, like... like 
Uh, this is one of the darkest promos I've ever seen him deliver. He's really relish, relishing being evil, being really I bad. Think his promos immediately after the snake bite incident. No, the, the uh, Miss Elizabeth and Macho Man's wedding were really dark as well. And this is of that period as well. Mm, mm. He was. He was turning into a really dark character. And I love Jake as a heel. Yeah, I much yeah, prefer him yeah. as a heel. I think he's far more interesting. Um, Towards the end for me, it was where the promo started to break down. So Tuesday in Texas, Elizabeth has a one-way ticket to the other side. Says Tuesday in Texas about five or six times during the promo, yeah. which was getting really boring, Texas. man. Yeah, yeah. And I just thought it, it ended really weird. It seemed like he'd, he'd lost his way in the promo a little bit. For me, but, you know, you you liked it and that's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I thought, it could have been better. I thought Snake could have um, sold the... The snake thing a little bit further, yeah. you know, and at that point. Uh, so at this point, Gorilla lets everyone know that Tuesday in Texas is a pay per view that's happening. Uh, Call I your. Keep, I keep forgetting. Providers. I keep, I keep forgetting the day. I keep, I keep forgetting, forgetting the location. You know, um, it's just money grabbing. You know, and why want that match at Survivor Series? Like, don't just have interviews with them. Yeah. But they're not. They're saving it to try and make a bit more money. Wrong. If you put over crap pay per And it's really bad because 91 was such a good year for pay per views. Yeah. I haven't watched this Tuesday in Texas for a long time and I don't really remember it. But I bet it, it's a good card. Mm. I know that much. Um, and I bet it is really good. But this is just like really. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If they did it these days, you know, people would just unsubscribe Switch from off. the network yeah, 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 and go, yeah. you know. Well, I'll people, wait until people the next do that, you know, nine ninety nine, you know, kind of thing. But it's kind of humorous. And the kickoff show, it's quite that's sparingly, fine, you know, yeah, it's, it's quite, like yeah. that's their tool for getting across for people that don't have the networks. It's shown on YouTube. We we'll yeah. get the network. That's fine. This just no way, man. Much, no yeah. way. I, and I don't mind it during like weekly raw programming. You know, yeah. it's just at a pay per view. Focus on the pay per view, not a next mid card pay per view. Anyway, that's me being angry over. Hogan and Flair um, on the funeral parlour. We this see this segment really, of them. It's a really this, cool this promo. This was really good. I like yeah. this a lot. Yeah. This was, again, not filmed as part of the event. This is part of... This is, so most of the best bits of this were actually promos that were filmed like this, the Macho Man with the Snake segment, um, all stuff that's been filmed previously. So Hogan and Flair on the funeral parlour, squaring up. A shame that we never got to see this match properly in the mm. WWF. Mm. Um, they did it at WCW. Was it Bash at the Beach? I yeah, think? and it was and yeah, it, was it was pretty was poor, pretty terrible. Um, this would have been a perfect time at the next WrestleMania. We get Sid Vicious versus Hulk Hogan and Macho Man versus Ric Flair. Yeah, I know the Macho Man match is great, and the Sid Vicious <laughs> yeah. and Hogan match is just filled with botches. Yes, but that probably would have been the pay per view to have done the Hogan Flair. Yeah. I think every time you mention uh, Vicious, uh, obviously I covered him last time, but then that that leg snap. Oh no, man! Yeah, good cool. You just you can see it, and you see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah, never yeah. seen yeah. anything like it. No, no, no. Um, oh, I have. The, the internet's full of weird and wonderful things. Why do you watch these things? I'm just sick. Um, <laughs> I watch wrestling. I'm sick. Um, so. WWF during this segment have blared out Flair's title. Flair will find out who has the real world title. Undertaker comes out of his coffin at that point and attacks Hogan with his urn. Piper and Macho come out to help Hogan with chairs. Undertaker no sells the yeah, chair yeah, shots. Yeah, 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 yeah. As he does. I like that. Uh, and, and rips he... off Hogan's yeah. cross. Yes. This was interesting to me because this was a callback in my opinion to the Andre Hogan feud from WrestleMania 3 where Andre had that great moment where he accidentally broke off the cross and it became not just uh, not just a match about wrestling but also religious symbology brought into it you know I thought it was I thought it was good really clever yeah yeah. really good so the match in question is the Undertaker with Paul Bearer versus Hulk Hogan Mm, yeah um, during Undertaker's entrances, the, the, this period of WWF is fascinating to watch Undertaker's entrances because you see the kids in yeah, the crowd man, and they're shitting themselves. Yeah, they're so scared, yeah. You know, um, I love seeing the kids' reactions. And a great contrast as well at this point to Hogan. Yeah. These two could have really gone at it in this period and I think Hogan was lobbying backstage for it not to be The Undertaker. I think he was lobbying hard against The Undertaker, especially after an incident at this pay-per-view. But we'll go into that after the match a little bit. 
So Hogan pushes over Undertaker's casket when he gets into the ring. I don't know why the casket had come from, or yeah. what, sorry, where it had come from, or why it was there. Wrestling. One, wrestling. Uh, Undertaker's gaze never leaves Hogan as Hogan circles him. That's a really nice sort of mm. character moment mm. that we see from Undertaker a lot, that sort of intensity. Undertaker chokes out Hogan in the corner of the ring. Uh, it looked like he was having an internal orgasm. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I really like I loved It's an iconic moment. You see it repeated quite a lot. Um, the image of Taker looking directly at the camera and like looking down like that but he's choking Hogan yeah, at the yeah. same time yeah there's a lot of it and also the way Hogan takes the tombstone is, is used quite a lot because you know he shakes his body are we on about the last one or? yeah because yeah, the, 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 the first tombstone yeah, is yeah. awful yeah yeah but like yeah. Um, just the way well takes, you know, there's a bit of a, lot a of iconic, thing with lot, that yeah a lot of iconic moments in this match that, that uh, even though we're not great fans I'm speaking for you, but at least we're not great fans of this pay-per-view. There are a couple of iconic moments, particularly within this match, that show up still uh, today. Yeah, I, I won't say it's a good match by any standard, but um, and I have problems with the bookings of the match, but we'll talk about that later on. Uh, Paul Bearer chokes Hogan on the apron, um, and then the camera turns with uh, him saying, Hogan, rest in peace. Mm-hmm. Paul Bearer had this amazing ability of getting into the camera exactly when he needed to be, mm-hmm. and he was, pull- he was so, he, he pulled so many Expressions. He looked fantastic, oh, didn't Paul he? Paul Bearer was incredible. Absolutely do, incredible. Do me a Paul Bearer impression, Tom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go on, you do me yours. Oh, yes. Yours is better. Thanks, thanks, dude. Boom. Um, Paul Bearer Church Hogan said that already. Bearer had a great ability, I've told you that already. Hulk Hogan can't slam The Undertaker. Uh, so we see that sort of battle yeah. for him to overcome. Hogan, Which is a constant thing for Hogan. Yeah. Uh, Hogan clotheslines Undertaker over the top rope. He lands on his feet. He Undertaker did this very well all the time for a big guy, didn't he? Um, sort of just going over the rope and just l- walking off. <laughs> he, he, he executes an incredible flying clothesline as well. Loved his flying there is clothesline. in this match, yeah. It's brilliant. Uh, and that comes out... It's iconic again. Yeah, obviously comes out a lot in his later career too. Yeah. The problem with the match is it's really slow. And I get Undertaker's mistake... Um, but it doesn't feel like there's a fight in the match, and that's that's a real problem. Mm. There's a woman dressed in the crowd uh, on the front row, dressed as Hulk Hogan, and she's trying to get the crowd pumped because the crowd just seem a bit dead towards yeah. this. I mean, I don't know if it's because of a reaction to Undertaker yeah. or Hogan being people, beat. Or... A lot of people didn't know what to make of the character. Parents well, no. as well. I was watching an interview with The Undertaker, and he was saying like 60% of the audience were cheering Hogan, but there was 40% when he came out that were still cheering Undertaker. So even though Undertaker was the heel, he was kind of getting across with the audience, which is mm. which, which is a, why he's such a fascinating character. Uh, the Undertaker kept getting power from the end. There was a few nice moments where he sort of reaches out to the end in the match, which was great character work. Yeah, th- again, that comes out later on. So right up until, I think, the Ministry of Darkness Taker, he's still drawing from the end. Drawing from the end, yeah. yeah. Uh, we get the Hulk up moment from Hulk with Hulk getting out of a chokehold. Undertaker was sort of using the chokehold mm. quite a lot at this time. Um, it didn't last long enough, though. It sort of is, is is brought down to a stop. So instead of it being a fight, we don't actually get that fight. It's mm. just cut short. Um, Undertaker tombstones Hogan. I hate this moment in the match. Hogan gets up straight away, right? Mm-hmm. Why the tombstone is such a devastating move, and it should have been sold as that. This should have been a pin attempt, and it could have been Hogan kicking out at the last second, but that's how it would have worked, mm. not by Hogan standing up and doing his... Yeah, doing work. it. You know, that's that's just a bad... That's in my a, opinion, that's, that's a really bad call on That's the, an on ego the thing from Hogan, I think. I though. think so, yeah. I mean... Yeah, so then Hogan has a little bit of a rally, gets Taker down to one knee. And at this point, Ric Flair comes to ringside. Hulk attacks him. Undertaker gets a second to Yeah, Bob Bearer had also, also interfered as well. He did, yeah. Uh, so Hogan's getting the best of everyone. Um, Undertaker gets him into a tombstone position. Ric Flair slips a chair into the ring. And Hogan gets tombstone onto the chair. You can clearly see, by the way, before I, I know what you're about to talk about, you can clearly see his head does not touch the chair. It's about a foot away from the chair. His, his, his head was nowhere the near the chair. Um, so to the match, first of all, before we sort of talk about that ending, because um, he does a good job of selling being hurt in the ring, mm. and there's a reason for that, which is Hogan's backstage politics. 
was, was that was when all the officials were helping up, and it, we sort of said to each other, "He's doing a good job of selling that, but why couldn't he sell the first bloody thing?" Yeah, you know? so, yeah, yeah. Um, really bad choreography, in my opinion, in this match. I know it's sort of iconic in in many aspects, but there wasn't enough fight back from Hogan to make it feel like a big title match mm -hmm. and for me that's what it missed and I don't think that's necessarily just Hogan's fault I think it's the booking's fault and mm -hmm. whoever laid out the match for him um, I, I, I would have actually preferred if Undertaker had gone in choke slammed or tombstoned Hulk and he dropped the belt I would have preferred that to this match you know like uh, a squash match I, I, I have time for this match I have time for it in relation to Hogan's character and the fact that he's immortal and all that idea, I, I have time for this. Um, I mean, I, I don't necessarily have time for Hogan's backstage politics, mm. but I have time for this match. So after the match, there was a lot of heat backstage on Undertaker. Undertaker went back to the dressing room and Hogan was out there and he was really selling this, this move that was a foot away from the bloody chair. Mm -hmm. Hogan basically made it out backstage from from interviews that I've listened to that he was genuinely hurt by the tombstone that was 30 centimetres away from the chair. Yeah. Um, which was just about him... I think it was about him being pissy to losing the belt to Undertaker, yeah. but that's just it. Yeah, Hogan's it, backstage it, it just politics, wasn't man. a fan of the taker at all. He was, yeah. over, he was overselling the injury... Completely, yeah. Yeah. and I think he was trying to bury the Undertaker. I think he was afraid of the Undertaker. I think I think he knew that the Undertaker was going to be a big deal, because yeah. people were fascinated by him, and yeah. he was so he was afraid next, of losing he was the that. Next, you know, well, he became the next great icon, didn't he? I mean, there's never been a guy since so you got Flair, you got a you got. Tate. Depends what you mean by icon. If you're talking about icon in wrestling, yeah, in terms of icon in because Hogan, Hogan, when pop culture pop culture as well though no I think Hogan went further than pop culture and I think there's been people that have gone bigger than Undertaker I think yeah. John Cena's bigger than Undertaker in mm. terms of pop culture and I'd also argue about The Rock as well yeah being okay. bigger in terms yeah, of okay. I get in wrestling Undertaker in wrestling. is sort of um, that legend the guy. Like, yeah I, absolutely I would, say, I would say in wrestling terms uh, in him, wrestling terms I'd say he's bigger than The Rock to, I'd say, like, uh, yeah and I'd say he's probably potentially like, so him and Flair are on par I would say. Yeah, and then I think um, it's sort of Hogan uh, on top he, in some, because of because of the eighties. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put Hogan on top of in terms of wrestling. I'd put him on top in terms of pop culture. Rock, yeah. Rock is number one. Hogan's number two. I don't know Hogan. In the, although we dislike Hogan, I don't think we can deny what Hogan did in the eighties. You know, it's mm. yeah, okay. Uh, but he brought I'd a lot still, of eyes into. I'd wrestling. still put Taker. I'd say I'd say in terms of impact. And diversity in terms of performance, Taker's number one, Flair's number two, Hogan's number three, Shawn Michaels number four. Mm, I'd probably go Hogan, Undertaker, um, Flair, uh, The Rock. Um, but Rock would be my fifth and Stone Cold would be my sixth. Mm, yes, oh no, maybe Stone Cold. Over there. Anyway, yeah, interesting interesting yeah. Uh, yeah. conversation top, for another top time. Top five, yeah, top five uh, greatest performers and wrestlers and and oh well Hulk Hogan's not in that list do, at all <laughs> yeah why, why, why do pop culture yeah it's yeah, encompassing yeah. all of those things yeah. you'd like to see your top five if you've got one yeah let's know what you think maybe we could do a list in, in terms maybe of we could. all round all round impact pop culture mm -hmm. uh, performance and wrestling that'd be an interesting list man so then we have an interview with Roddy Piper who was upset about Hogan being beat he calls like from this too it was a good promo, yeah. He calls Undertaker an Adams Family reject, which is good at one point. Um, and Ric Flair, I think he refers to him as The Thing, which is another <laughs> character from the Adams Family. And then we have a Ric Flair and Perfect interview in the ro locker room. Ric uh, Rick Flair was really good at, at oh, yeah. promos, wasn't oh, he? Really he was good. Undeniably great. Um, Perfect says, Hulkamania's been bust. Ric Flair told Hogan he was short-lived, and by God, he is. The Hulkamaniacs are wondering what's next, but Flair says it's all over. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Uh, we're informed that Hogan is in Tunney's office right now. Um, he's talking about this Tuesday in Texas. Yep. Uh, we have an interview for his rematch, isn't it? Mm, we have an interview with Earthquake, Typhoon and IRS, which was a bit boring. Um, I've decided that n neither of these teams, uh, Legion of Doom included, can give great promos. No tag team. Oh, they didn't do no, did. No, it was no, just a bit sick. This was they, uh, this wasn't a good tag promo. team promos in the eighties and early nineties. Nobody was good at it. That's mm, my what a rush. Nope. 
No, that. you don't even that was that was the catch for water rush. That's what ah, I popped for water rush, but that was the only interest. That was the only thing you popped for. Cool. Uh, just not a fan of any any team. Not not one team in the eighties has put together an exciting promo. That yeah, they got have. into. You got Jake Watcher the Man got, and no, Hulk. Uh, did yeah, some but good they're promos. more notably notable. Even as Ultimate Warrior and Hulk. Yeah, but they're notable as singles. Oh uh, right, in terms of tag team. People that are pure tag Ooh. team. Demolition. No. Nope. Demolition not that like great with axe. Not that like great. Good promo. I think uh, not that like I great. think they put on good Not that like great. You wanna? I, I especially liked axe. Um, yeah. Here comes the axe. And here comes the. S- nice. Yeah, they're not here anymore. Um, so Typhoon has some shocking news. Which? Why is that funny, Dom? I'm the shock bastard. <laughs> <laughs> what a tugboat. Uh, yeah, but Tugboat became Typhoon. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, Tugboat. Yeah, t- yeah, yeah, I forget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so then we have the interview with LOD and Bossman. Bossman isn't a tax cheat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, see? weird few. See? Yeah, Just it was crap. I agree with this. Um, well, that's good to know, I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, interview with Jack Tunney. Referee's decision is final, and they're having a rematch. At, guess what pay per view, Dom? Tuesday, Texas. Tuesday in Texas. And how much can you buy that pay-per-view for? Uh, <laughs> ah, whatever. I'd lost it by then. Call your local service provider. Um, yeah, also, Tony will be at ringside for that match to oversee proceedings. So, again, selling this Tuesday in Sodden, Texas, man. So, next match, we have the Nasty Boys, Brian Nobbs and Jerry Sachs, and the Beverly Brothers, Bo and Blake Beverly, versus the Bushwhackers, Butch and Luke, and the Rockers. On lineup, I sort of saw that and I thought, well, "Nasty Boys and the Rockers, that'd be that'd be yeah. all right." Wasn't uh, a little bit of background yeah. into the Beverly Brothers because that's the first time they're joining this pay per view. If you're enjoying the uh, podcast, please hit that thumbs up button. The Beverly Brothers, as they were known in the WWF, formed in the AWA in 1989 and called themselves the Destruction Crew. What's a better name, Dom? The Beverly Brothers or the Destruction Crew? I really like the Destruction Crew, actually. That's a really cool name, mm. but I suppose you had maybe had too much of it with yeah. Legion of Doom yeah. and the Natural Disaster. That kind maybe. Of similar vibe, yeah. But the Beverly Brothers, that was never a name that was going to get over, was it? Mm. Really? Nope. It's like the Rougeau Brothers. It's too similar. Yes. And I don't think the Rougeurs ever got over very well. I think no, the, the Mountie got over the more Mountie, than the Rougeurs. And then the Quebecers later. Yes. Even, even the Quebecers. Even the, but the Quebecers is a better name than the Rougeau brothers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they had title success in the AWA. I've, only, I've only just figured out Go on. that Quebecers was because they were from Canada, from Quebec. We're from Quebec, yeah. And I've, I've, only, just, I've only just put Ding. those put those things together. <laughs> if you rewind the podcast, you can see that moment I, where Dom I, I went. Just, I, I, I just literally have been pl- listening to this, you know, I've been, been, uh, been watching this team, oddly, for a number of years, you know, previously, just going, what a weird name the Quebecers is. Why are they called the Quebecers? And I knew they were from Canada. <laughs> and I just didn't, <laughs> I just didn't, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in my thirties, guys. Yeah. I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, they had the, the they had title success in the AWA. However, not as much success when they joined WCW in the 1990s. The Beverly Brothers were given a really good initial push in the WWF, mm. including in this match. Uh, but that would soon fade, especially after they lost the match to the Natural Disasters in '92. I think, I believe that's at SummerSlam. Yeah. I think. Uh, Bo left the WWF in 1993, leaving Blake to have a brief run as a singles competitor, mainly working as enhancement talent on TV shows. Yeah. Blake went to WCW from 96 to 2000, where he was repackaged as the Mauler. Do you remember the Mauler? No. Here's a really iconic moment from the Mauler, and it has nothing to do with the Mauler. But you've seen it several times. I like how you keep saying the Mauler. But it's a good name, isn't it? The Mauler. Go on, tell me what the moment is. Do you know the moment uh, Scott Hall comes down into WCW? His debut, where he sort of sits in the front row of seats mm-hmm. during a wrestling match. It is the Mauler who was in the ring at that point. There wow. you go. That's cool. That is cool. That's that's not a great highlight of a career, though, is it? <laughs> you was there when someone else yeah, came in. So, oh, I was there when Razor yeah. Ramon joined WCW. Uh, the two reunited briefly in 97 and 98 in WCW. Um, nothing really notable to say about them. So, on to the match. Shawn Michaels, when he comes down to this match, looked boss. Mm, yeah, yeah. 
It was clear get, that he was going to have a singles run. He knew his push was coming. This is this is the start. This is the dissension in the ranks. But he'd clearly been working out because his arms. I don't. Th- I don't know if. Can you think of a time where he had bigger arms than this? No. Good point. He he had really big arms in this. He'd clearly been working out a lot. He looked massive. Um, so he knew his solo push was coming, and this match sort of spurned into this the mm-hmm. solo push. But I have real problems with the way that was done. Um, so at the start of the match, we see battering the rangs from the Bushwhackers to the Beverly Brothers, followed by a double drop kick from the Rockers to the Nasty Boys. And my problem with the Bushwhackers is you you put them in a match like this, and you can't really take it seriously. Yeah, can you? yeah. They're very, it was very it was very silly. Really. I know you enjoy the Bushwhackers. I do. But I, I just, I really, I go back to what I said a couple of episodes ago. I really wish it would stayed as a sheep herders and just been a brutal tag team, you know. Yeah, it would have looked better. It would have, yeah. Um, anyway, there was, I suppose kids loved them, so that was the, mm-hmm. that was the point. Yeah. And I'm, I guess you like them because of your memories of them. Yeah, as yeah, opposed absolutely. To watching them now. Absolutely, but I'm not even. Yeah, you, you get spared a licking today because they weren't that great. They just didn't. No. It wasn't no. really a great show. No. From them. Um, it all seemed a little dead, even when Michaels was in the ring. Uh, Nobs, Nobs takes out uh, Butch from the top rope for the pin. Yeah, it was all very lackluster. This match, L- little parts of it were yeah, a little bit sped up with the Rockers again, where it was in the card. But it just yeah, it didn't really justify where it was. I don't think. No, um, and also because this match was focused on tag teams, and the next match was focused on tag teams as well. I don't think that mm-hmm. worked quite mm-hmm. as well. No. I think perhaps if they'd put one of the one of these matches earlier on and had the, one of the singles yeah. matches because you've had two s- single Survivor Series matches two tag teams why not split them up a little bit yeah. I also think get rid of Butch and Luke get rid of the Beverly Brothers and have a couple of single competitors in this mm-hmm. I think might have been more interesting uh, Macho Man's free you yeah. know no, I mean yeah. they're not because nah. they were supposed to be in the next match mean. but there was other people in the WWF at this time who were great who were being shown you know yes agreed um and uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, Saxon Janetti speed things up a little with a couple of hip, hip tosses. Mm. So it looked okay. Janetti gets a nice super kick onto one of the Beverly brothers. But even the super kick that Janetti does, he sort of stumbles over afterwards. Mm. It, it was a really weak show from Janetti, yeah. this one. I think he improved at the end, you know, when he, he's, uh, spoiler alert, he's the last man in. Uh, and he, he Yeah, he did a little bit. But excites, you know, brings, brings some excitement into the match. But, but uh, you, you've, got to ha- you've got to build it up. You can't just do it all at the end. And true. it was a bit sloppy. There was a lot of, excuse me, there was a lot of sloppy wrestling mm. in this pay-per-view, I felt. Um Janetti gets, uh, yeah, so the nice super kick. The two, uh, the two connect during an Irish whip. Mm. Really sloppy fall to the floor again. There was a load of, there was a couple of these in the next match as well where they sort of connect with each other and real sloppily fall to the yeah. floor. Luke gets in and gets uh, a little bit more exciting for two seconds, but after a, well, it was a really nice spike slam from the Beverly Brothers, yeah. which was their finisher. Yeah, He's I, eliminated. I really like that. I like it was that. a good move, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but I, you know, Luke be for Luke to come in and to raise the energy mm. and excitement more than the Rockers were doing. Yeah. Something was going yeah, wrong there, no, man. Janetti's back in, and there was something about his performance that was not as sharp as it normally was. Um, Bo, the Bo Brevely brother, um, who does probably the best work in the match in his ring against Shawn Michaels at this point with really clean moves mm. but eventually he's pinned so he's out of the match anyway I think it was Bo mm. it's hard to tell them apart isn't it uh, Michaels does a running clothesline off the apron to Sags that was again a good looking mm. move mm-hmm. but only one move to, that took too long to get to yeah Nobbs did a really brutal looking slam on Janetti at one point, very brawly in a heavy move. The Rockers get everyone in the ring, sandwiching a Beverly brother between the two nasty boys, a segment that we've seen a few times now. Mm-hmm. When Janetti slams Nobbs, he accidentally falls. He, oh, right, so when, when Janetti slams Nobbs, he accidentally hits Michaels in the face with his foot. Uh, this causes Michaels to get pinned and, and starts the that argument that between them in the yeah, ring. Yeah. I thought that was a bit weak. I get the dissension, mm-hmm. but I think it was because of the match. The match was entirely weak. Yeah. Um, and it they didn't play it off very well, I don't say, against each other. Yeah. It didn't feel real. It felt like it was coming. It, it wasn't like, do you know that moment when Macho Man and Hogan was in the ring and we see Hogan, Elizabeth going to Hogan first, and it's all done really nicely. Yeah. 
that this should, could have been something like that and it wasn't you know it could have been a really nice discreet moment yeah. that was sort of it was all just it all just felt a bit sloppy bit, yeah to me. a bit over the top and a bit much yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the heels dominate Janetti for a while he fights back nearly pinning one of the nasty boys but whilst the ref is distracted uh, the other nasty reverses it and Janetti is pinned yeah a little messy this match I mm. felt uh, mm. not a definite turning point but we no. g- the the recovered it with a great barbershop shop segment yes, which of comes course. up yeah, that, which is that, that iconic is iconic yeah you're right um, and my problem with the commentators at this point is that Heenan's selling the WWF magazine saying, oh, if you mm, bought the mm, WWF mm. magazine, you'd see that there was dissension in the ranks of the Rockers. And again, it's not about the match. It's yeah, about selling more yeah. WWF products. It's like too much, man. You know? You're that over the top, yeah. I thought, it, I thought the match went on way too long. I was sort of... It felt like it went on for mm, ages mm. and it actually... It was about 21 minutes, but it felt so long. Yeah. Without enough excitement... Well, normal WWE matches, like standard ones, go 10 minutes tops, don't they? Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was... So it was but a Survivor Series can go on for 20 minutes, but this felt like yeah. it was an hour. Yeah. You know, it was, it was poor, man. Yeah. Uh, and then we move straight into the next match. Now, I've got a problem with this because we're not having any build-up to the next match. So apart yeah. from a few really weak promos that have come earlier on, we're just going straight into it. Um, yeah, it seems like after the... After... Hulk and Undertaker's match mm. sort of the crowd just seemed to slip and I don't yeah. even think they were that invested yeah, in no, that I, you know? I, I, no I think that was uh, that was probably the, the last great peak of audience participation uh, you know the best thing about this is you know that we got to find out that Bossman pays his taxes you know uh, that was pretty much the most uh, exciting revelation IRS you know IRS is the last guy in you know the heels you know the heels you, you got you got you got Earthquake and you got Typhoon you know when Typhoon goes out after I, IRS you know Waxing with the briefcase, you've got these the two heels going out and leaving IRS on their own, which is you know, it's weird. It it's paints, a weird it first paints, move. It paints uh, Earthquake as a face wants to take care of yeah. his friend, and the wet becoming faces. So we're going into yeah, a feud with Legion. It was adorable, it was a nice except, moment, except you know, and then IRS gets left against the two faces. Uh, spoiler alert again, Legion of Doom, yeah, and um, Legion of Doom look good, I guess, but they were the top, they were certainly the, the best of a bad bunch in this match. Um, yes. Wasn't a fan of uh, uh, IRS. Was, he worked really hard. Um, IRS is a good wrestler. Yeah, yeah. It was a good yeah. wrestler. Uh, going into the match, uh, Owen Ishaister talks into the match about t- all the t- tax dodgers in tonight, with b- mm. Bossman being the biggest. The Bossman starts off against IRS. Not a lot really happened. Some okay wrestling, I suppose. And then we have Earthquake versus Animal. Earthquake is in the lead until he misses a splash. Animal then uses his speed to get the advantage on Earthquake. This was really nice. Yeah. Do you remember I was talking a couple of episodes about who was better, Animal or Hawk? I think this match helped define that. I think Animal was yeah, better. Yeah, definitely. I think it's just a stronger performer, stronger all around, a great command of the crowd. Yeah, I, I don't think, think he had the... Like, Hawk was a promo guy, easily. But yeah. Animal, he was sort of really getting on top of Earthquake mm-hmm. and getting high to sort of dominate he was him, a great, which was good. Yeah, he, was, he, was a, he was a great all-around performer, a better wrestler, I think. Hawk is a similar kind of um, vibe as Piper, where... They, they, they promise greatness and they have that greatness within them but there's a lot of chaos in there that kind of yeah. counters that and, yeah. and makes you know on commentary it made Piper seem a bit um, frenetic seem a bit too you know a bit too out off the wall and in, mm. in the ring it made him a great intercontinental champion like a Dean Ambrose but there's was saying a lot of people don't want a guy like Hawk you know Representing the brand because he's a little bit too off the wall. Same I think with Piper, maybe same with Ambrose. You know? I think maybe the thing with um, Hawk as well is he was obviously renowned for his uh, addictions, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and perhaps that's why Animal was slightly better in the ring because he was sort of the more professional of yeah, the two, yeah, probably. It's but a great tag team. The Legion of Doom were a great tag team. And iconic. The faces get Typhoon in the corner and start doing heel-type shops whilst the ref backs turned. A re- really yeah. weird spot for the faces yeah. to be in. Very it, strange. It didn't make sense. Very strange, uh, Bossman and IRS back in the ring. Bossman uses IRS tie to drag him around the ring, which I thought was quite nice. Um, but IRS eventually uses his briefcase to get Bossman out to get the pin. Typhoon does a bear hug. His bear hug dry hump move. Yeah, what was that? It was sort of uh, in the corner, sort of humping yeah. animal. Wrestling. Wrestling. Uh, it really does look like he's dry humping him. Um, IRS comes in with his briefcase to attack Hawk, who's been helped by Typhoon, but helps Typhoon instead. Typhoon gets pinned. 
Earthquake gets uh, yeah, angry uh, with well, IRS. You say, you, say, you say help, but you mean hit, don't you? Yes, I did, yes, yeah. You did. Yeah. Did I? Thanks. Um, I just read the words. I, don't <laughs> <laughs> I just write the wrong words, apparently. Um, so Earthquake gets really angry with IRS, gets in his face. I thought a little bit more could have made of that moment, because that yeah. was a really... And then it's, instead, it just he just goes off with Typhoon. Well, it goes off with Typhoon, and he's, sort of, he's cuddling it's him. And yeah. He's adorable. I mean, it would have been a nice face turn, and yeah, it's a shame yeah. that they didn't do the face turn at this point. Yeah. Um, because we're heading into a feud with Legion of Doom, which I think would be great heels as well, Legion of Doom. I know that they're strong faces as well, but Legion of Doom were a great heel team as well, Mm. if you look at their early work as well. So then we get IRS throwing Hawk around the outside of the ring into the steel steps. We've seen that a few times tonight. Iris and Hawk uh, sloppily, again, connect with each other when running into each other. A few times in this pay-per-view we've seen that exact same thing happen. Legion of Doom do a double clothesline to IRS and he starts walking to the back, fed up with the match, um, as we we are with the pay-per-view at this mm-hmm. point. Yeah. Big Boss Man comes out and says, get your ass back into the ring, boy. Um, Hawk gets a big clothesline off the top rope for the pin. Yeah. What? I, I actually We've like got that. Legion of Doom. You what? Uh, no, you need a doomsday device, Yeah, but it's, it's the variation of the, the doomsday device, isn't it? It's the, the, the clothesline that Hawk does. Yeah, but, but I want to see it on animal well, shoulders. Animal I shoulders. don't know if it was IRS who didn't want to say it. A lot of people were... Paul Roma was really afraid of taking the doomsday device at, the, yeah, yeah. at one of the... So maybe it was just a thing where yeah. IRS refused to do it. I don't know. But it was a shame. Let's end the pay-per-view on actually a decent yeah, move. Yeah, they didn't. Um, an interview backstage where the interviewers talk to Hogan and we're not actually getting an interview with Hogan. He's saving his he's, words. Yeah, when for, Dom? For Tuesday in Texas. Where Very he's gonna good. Where he's going to get his rematch. And uh, what's he getting? Yes, he's got his title for a shot at... At The Undertaker. Yeah, for Tuesday in, Tuesday Tuesday in Texas. Texas yeah. Um, and then we go into a really weird little promo that's actually quite good and funny. Uh, Gene Oakland is in the catacombs area <laughs> the arena, of the arena. The arena yeah. What what yeah. arenas have catacombs, well, Dom? Well, well, the the deep dark basements. That's fine. It's the deep dark basements. Does the Wembley Arena have catacombs? Well, well, maybe, maybe for the maybe. Undertaker. It's like the boiler rooms of mankind, isn't it? Every, it is, every, yeah. every you know every venue has a boiler room, and mankind used to. Hang well, out. but venues actually have well, yeah, boiler yeah, rooms. Yeah, you know, they, they need a boiler room. Yeah, they don't. They can, don't need a, a graveyard. A, you can make <laughs> <laughs> you can make a boiler room into uh, catacombs if you wanted. Yeah, you could, yeah. Well, they did, they clearly. Did. Um, so, yeah, nice lighting in this segment. We're sort of going into that nice yeah. lighting segments with Undertaker and uh, Paul Bearer. Uh, Paul Bearer says, nothing is immortal. That wasn't as good. No, you, uh, you're on fire with these. Actually. Not no. even Hulkamania. He talks Hulkamania about keeping dead. Hulkamania is dead. And he talks something about keeping Hulk Hogan in the embalming room until the... Yeah. Funeral or something, which is a little bit yeah, dark. Yeah, he opens the coffin and you think, is Hogan in there? Like, what's going on? Well, he says that they the want cameras. to enlighten Hogan as to what they've got in store for him. And then yeah. the coffin opens up and a green light shines on and we can't really see and him. you can see up because the camera's in the coffin. You know, yeah, you man, a mean gene goes. Yeah, yeah. And the Undertaker is like looking, he's talking <laughs> to the camera, looking down, which is really clever. He talks a little too much, actually. Mm. Yeah, this one. I can't remember what exactly Mr. Oakland. Mr. Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> when I meet blah blah, it's going to be. It didn't even say rest in peace, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think Anyway. So. Um, yeah, it just talks about uh, demolishing Hogan at the next pay per view. Shame Hogan was rallying against The Undertaker. Yes. I wonder what. I, don't, I reckon they would have kept the title on Undertaker had it not been for. Hogan's rallying backstage. Yes. And I wonder how that would have affected Undertaker's career. Hmm. I think most people saw through Hogan's rallying, though. Like, it seems that I've been reading interviews and stuff. Mm, I don't most think people, the crowd did most, Yeah, but most people backstage thought... Yeah, but oh, bearing in mind Undertaker didn't get a title for another five years, I think, and he was so over. Yeah. Um... That's that had a lasting impression, mm. really. Right. So um, I do wonder what effect it would have had had this mm. had this whole thing ha- not happened. Sad, really. Um, yeah, didn't enjoy this pay per view as, as you probably established yeah, by not, now. Not not the best. Um, Rubbish end into the first match. Second match felt pointless. Yeah, Hogan, the, and, Hogan and Undertaker the, the, was too slow. Yeah, the Rockers best match rift. Was probably the first one. Rockers rift was notable. No, uh, and the, the Undertaker. Yeah. Uh, Hogan match, excuse me, to establish Undertaker was okay. 
The best match is hard to say. I'd say the first half of the first match, probably the Undertaker promo. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, it, it was the, crap. The Piper promo was okay. The Raj Savage promo was another highlight. But, I mean, promo shouldn't be the highlight. They should build into the wrestling. Yeah, and yeah. none of them did no. at this point. It was all building up to another pay per view, yeah, yeah. which is sad. Yeah. Uh, how many gay stars, Dom? Uh, two. One and a half. One and a half. Let me keep going. I'm gonna go with one half. All right. What What are you one my half? half is, my half is for the promos. My one is for the first half of that match. So based on half a match and a couple of promos that lasted three minutes, and the you Undertaker are... Hogan match, which I thought was alright. I didn't like it. Uh, I give it one star. Um, yeah. Just have we ever gone pop. to one star? No, I don't think so. Wow. I think this is possible. I think you could argue WrestleMania two really wasn't very good. Mm. But I do think this is possibly Very one tedious. Of, I think it's one of the worst pay-per-views, and I think that it's a lot of missed opportunities. Yeah. And the fact that, that I've really enjoyed the Survivor Series leading up to yeah. this Survivor yeah. Series. Yeah, and which this you can just... check out on the channel. Yeah. Absolutely. So please uh, like, comment, and subscribe check. as normal. Yeah, check us out on Patreon, Facebook, Twitter, all slash give me a whole yeah. Don't forget to buy uh, cups and T-shirts because we like wearing them, and you'll like wearing them too. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. And, yeah. And any shares on the video always yeah, help us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the shares. Yeah, Obviously, thanks for all your support, dude. It's feedback, been great. Any, any, any love, any hate, we'll take it all. We'll take it all in our stride. <laughs> Woo! Ooh, keep, right, it keep it gay. Keep it gay.